What does it mean to be dumb as something? We tend to work on a lot of artifacts. Things like designs and tests and plans and all kinds of things. How do we know when we're done with this kind of stuff? What does it mean to be done? Because we can be overdone or underdone and that's a lot of extra work. I mean, if we're underdone, then people, the next step in line here, are starved for work. They don't have anything to do or they're missing pieces and they're frustrated. Or we get buried under an avalanche of things to do that aren't typically adding a lot of value. So how do we find the right level of doneness? Well, I've actually gone out and I've looked at lots of our clients' documentation from hundreds and hundreds of clients, and I've been able to see what they think kind of done looks like. And what I actually see is, when I ask the question what's done is, I see lots of things that are overdone. Things like the table of contents and the document's purpose. And I see a lot of things that are underdone. Things like <laughs> the actual requirements and the actual design rationale. It just isn't there. And so why is this? Well, it could be, you know, things like the table of contents, signature pages. These are what a friend of mine called the blah, blah pages. They tend to go blah, 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 blah. But they're easy to check off, easy to say that, yes, those are done. But these other things, things like the actual requirements and the design rationale, these tend to be contextual. That is, in a different context, it might be done for one context and not done in the other context. Which leaves us kind of like, What's all that about, right? How do I understand this contextual thing? And here's a great example. Here's a requirement. You can look at this and say, you know what, this is awful. Just go faster is not a good requirement. But what if the team understood this, knew what they were talking about, and actually delivered it correctly? Then that's a fine requirement. It works just fine. So how do we get this thing, this doneness often defined? Well. Typically what we have is we have some committee gets together and says, okay, we're going to define the template or the procedure of what done looks like here. And then create, you know, the mother of all templates here. And the, it is the mother because they take every idea that they can think of, every tool that they have, and try to shove it into that thing, whether it's needed or not. Well, the idea is someone might actually use it. And then they tell themselves this little white lie. Everyone who does use it well, modify it, tailor it to their own needs. But the moment that someone does it, the process police comes along then <laughs> zaps them, right? And so you end up doing a lot of overwork, especially on the blah, blah pages. The only other option they have is to bring in some really smart individual and say, yes, you're gonna make it happen here. Right? So that doesn't really solve our contextual problem at all, does it? Well, maybe it has to do with this idea of the word done itself, right? When we say done, maybe we should be thinking of doneness because you're never really quite always done, but you might be done enough. And that's where I come up with my good enough criteria. What does it mean to say we're done enough or we're good enough? And I have four criteria that I like to use to give me that sense of good enough. They are sufficiently complete, appropriate for the environment, sanity checks, and feedback from stakeholders. These combined give me a sense of good enough. So let's take a look at them. Sufficiently complete is all about making decisions. Do I have enough decision making or stuff done here to be sufficiently complete? Because I like to see the project as a series of decisions from high level decisions, things like what's the product all about, to you know very, very low level decisions down here about the work item or the use of preferences. That's what I think projects often do, they make decisions. And so we can think about sufficiently complete in light of that one decision. So let's take a look at the product decision here, or the project decision, I'm sorry, and just sort of blow it up a little bit here. We have to make decisions about the objectives, the architecture, and the features. And so we have to decide like, well, how are we gonna move this product forward given this particular project? And are the stakeholders really backing this up? From an architecture side, maybe we have to think things about what's our overall philosophy and what tools are we gonna use to build this? And from the feature side, we just have to see what's our list of features, what's in scope and what's out of scope. That's about it. Do we have to do all the requirements? No. Do we have to do all the design to make that decision? Again, no. We're sufficiently complete at that. So what we tend to do is we look at our overall process and we look at our process and say, where in the process do we have to make decisions, our star points here? And then at that particular decision, 
what do we need to decide? What information do we have to have in order to make that decision? That's what we're looking for here, right? And so as we see that information, what do we need to do to do that future work? We can say, do I have enough information to help that person do that one thing and then stop? I'm sufficiently complete. Appropriate for the environment looks at that person and says, okay, for that person, what do, who are they? You know, when will they use it? What are they doing? Where are they? Are they in a different time or place? And so do I have enough appropriate content for them? So let's look at this person, let's put that person and let's stick them on a team here and say, hey, this team, we'll call them oh, Team A. Team A is working on a product. And this team has been together a long time. They're, they've got 20 years together. We've got a lot of gray beards in here, right? So they really, really know the product. Now, contrast them with say, Team B. Team B, same number of people, but two of them are college grads, just recent grads, and three of them are working remotely somewhere, right? So they're not it's hardly even around. So if we look at these two teams, right, Team A and Team B, and looking at the work of the product, would we assume that they're actually using the same set of tools, same architectural approach, and creating the same artifacts? Even more, do we think we could switch these around between the two of them and have no change at all, right? Well, of course, we look at that and sort of label it absurd. Of course, they're going to be different. Team A has, has much more experience than Team B here, right? And so where do they actually differ? I think they differ in two critical areas, distance and competence. Because the idea is that the more distance I have, the more detail I need to create to make that work. The more competence I have, the more skill and knowledge, the less detail I need to have to make that work. So let's take a look at these. And let's, let's start with competence here, right? So competence to me sort of means that for the human brains or the brains we have working on it, they really understand the product and they really understand the business domain, all the work and workflows that the people have. Let me give you a couple examples of this. I had a client a while back who was working on a project and they were really smart. In fact, they were scientist smart. They were actually had a PhD in the same area as their customers who were also a bunch of PhDs, right? And what I said, okay, working with PhDs, that's a pain because they think they know it all. And he goes, yeah, you're right. What they do is they give me a spec and I look at that spec briefly and then I, I throw it in the trash and then I build them what they actually needed and they were astoundingly happy. That's great competence. But let me give you another story. Another client's working with, uh, they were working and they decided to outsource their stuff to Russia. Okay, fair enough, outsource it to Russia. So they built a spec, sent it to Russia, Russia sent out a product, and you know what? They couldn't use it, it didn't work. So what was their response to that? Well, the response was to write a really, really big spec, try to send more of that competence to Russia. So they sent it to Russia, Russia sent back a product, and it still failed. What to do? So here's what they decided to do. They decided to write a tiny little spec, send that to Russia, send one of the designers with it to Russia to capture all that competence. And finally, they got a product back that they could use that worked really, really well, right? So as we look at these two teams here, our team A and team B, we would expect to spend a little bit of effort coming up with a much, as much detail as we needed, but a lot more effort and time and money for the people that don't have as high as competence. And then there's distance. And I think distance comes in four flavors. There's obviously geographical distance, but I also think there's time distance. There's also team size and there's cultural difference. And just peeking at a couple of these, you know, if we look at the human distance, the geographical distance, it's easy for us to think about setting specs from one place to another. But we also have to remember that often to get done, we have to send human beings from one place to another as well, it's like we saw in that earlier client. And in our team size, this can have a big impact on detail because as messages get passed from one person to another, they start to change slightly. And as they move their way through, we could end up with lots of confusion on the back end down here. And so as we look at our two teams, we also see two other small facts we have to worry about is something unique or critical that we've never done before. And is there some legal or regulatory thing we have to do as well? That might sh try to shove us into more detail and try to make it appropriate for the environment. So appropriate to the environment, to me, kind of means these four things. Do we have competent teams? Are the distance factors taken care of? Do I see critical, unique things I have to spell out? 
or do I have legal or regulatory things I have to spell out? All this allows me then to set the dial to say, do I have the right amount of detail going forward? Sanity checks, sanity checks look at, looks at the work and says, hey, you know, as a human being, I have a really smart brain. And as we do things, I start to notice patterns. And one of the things that I notice patterns, when something doesn't match the pattern, it quickly sticks out, doesn't it? And then we can make a rule about it. Hey, are all the lines the same length? That's a little pattern, we can make a rule, and we can quickly check for that to see what's going on. And so what I do is I'm gonna take my brain, I'm gonna take some artifact that we're working on, and I'm gonna create a little checklist of those simple rules that I can look at and go, wow, does it violate any of my simple patterns? And we do this kind of stuff all the time. I have lots of relatives that call me up and say, you know, the computer's not working, fix it Earl. And one of my simple rules is to say, hey, have you checked to make sure that it's plugged in and turned on? Because I find a lot of times something's been turned off and you turn it back on, things start working again. That's the idea of these simple rules. There's something simple you can do to move it forward. Just like this timer here says it should take minutes, not hours to actually apply those simple rules. Now the simple rules are not a guarantee of doneness, right? We're not guaranteeing done. Because example, remember we had this little thing and we could say, yeah, it has pretty, you know, we want to have low ambiguity. That's our simple rule. But until I know the context, I really don't know that yet. But our simple rules can be used to help us say, have I done something really stupid? It helps me create awareness. And because they create awareness, I can use these all over the place. I use them as reviewers because if I look at a simple list, my ability to find defects, find things I actually want to care about, goes way up. I could also use them as the creator of the work because if I use it while I'm creating, then it's going to help me keep the defects down because I remember the simple rules. Another beautiful thing about these simple rules, I can use them all over the place and only have minor modifications as I change them from place to place. Yeah, there's uniqueness, but there's also something different or special for each one of those applications. Now, of course, all these things work better when I have a good and more senior team to actually make that kind of stuff happen, right? Feedback from stakeholders, the glue that sort of holds it together. So we've got three things we've talked about so far, sufficiently complete, appropriate for the environment, and sanity checks. But I actually have human beings who have to calibrate this. And so as I have human beings work on this, how do I make sure they're calibrated? How do I make sure they actually are sufficiently complete, appropriate for the environment, and sanity checks? That's where my feedback from stakeholders take effect. My feedback from suppliers I really care about, but also consumers, people are going to use it to do their work. From the supplier, I'm concerned about, did I get it right? And from the consumers, I'm concerned, am I giving it right? Am I giving you what you need to do your job? Let's take a look at the consumer, our supplier here first for a moment, right? Now, we're usually going to get feedback from some sort of review, but we can also do a couple other things, right? So I have a consumer here that says, you know, I want to invoice my customers. Can I just sort of hand in my designs, my UML designs, say, hey, did I get this right? No, that's not going to work, right? I'm going to have to do something different. Maybe what I need to do is go through and say, okay, let's model your process in the way you understand a simple workflow, something like that. And then maybe I build a prototype that starts mimicking that in a small, simple to build environment. And they can say, yes, you're understanding this. This is what I need to do. And I can even add to that by saying, having a panel of judges look at it and say, yeah, does that meet our design approach? And does it look like good design? That's good stuff overall. In a similar way, for my consumers, my consumers could be anyone, right? Even compilers are consumers. When I write code, right, someone has to turn that into ones and zeros. That's the compiler. So there's consumers all over the place. The trick with consumers is that you want to do just enough work here so that they have enough to get their job done. Sometimes that consumer is going to ask you to do a whole lot more work and basically ask them to do their job for you. Now we've got to push that work right onto that consumer and make them do that. But what's the technique we typically use to make sure we're good enough for, to, for the supplier and the consumer? We're going to have them review something. We're going to give them something and look at it and, you know, and get their signature on it. Now, this is good and it's all right. But, you know, I've gotten sometimes lots of signatures on things and it turns out no one actually ever read it. There was stuff in there that was totally wrong. And so while I have this kind of good feedback from people looking at it and signing off, I also like to have some lagging indicators. Something that says, yes, that review process is actually working pretty well. And I've got a couple lagging indicators I actually like a lot. One is change requests. Change requests from the suppliers. If I see them asking for things later on, 
that means I probably didn't a good job getting it out of them in the first place. I didn't ask them enough questions. I didn't help them explore their world very well. And in a similar vein, if I see a lot of defect counts coming from my consumers, that is they got it, I gave it to them, but they implemented it all wrong somehow, that tells me I didn't give it to them right. So this sort of wraps it up. I have my three kind of main things, officially complete, appropriate for the environment, and sanity checks. And I calibrate that all through feedback from the stakeholders. These four things combined give me a good sense of being done.